Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. And uh, a very exciting episode with Dylan Reisenberger coming up here on uh, a subject near and dear to my heart anyway. Mm-hmm. And uh, But first, man, how are you? I am well. I, you know, I'm going to Germany. That's right. You are. Yeah, yeah. We've uh, the, the Telerik folks are back. They've been sponsoring the shows and uh, they want to do a little tour. It's only three stops just in Germany, Berlin, uh, Cologne, and... Uh, Munich, and you're in the midst of a big project, so you can't go. So I get to do this solo. But it's kind of doing a modern web conversation. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm going to uh, be reprising a version of the history of .NET focused very much on web development. And we've got a couple of interesting speakers in that and uh, recorded .NET Rocks episode. So mini tour Germany. Yeah, this is really cool. You know, this is what happens when you can't figure out what you want to do for a living, you know, when you want to grow up. Uh, <laughs> I, have so, I wear so many hats that uh, I've got a software gig. I've, I've got Keto Fest that's happening right around yeah, then. No and, kidding. And uh, yeah, so. Yeah, it is during Keto Fest, isn't it? There's no way. You, it's during yeah, Keto it's Fest. Yeah, it's immediately after. I'd have yeah. to be traveling on Keto Fest weekend and I couldn't you do that. You can't do that. There's no way you could do that. Yeah, yeah. He, you, well, you sold, we haven't sold Keto Fest out, but you got your Kickstarter through. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Kickstarter's through. And if you go to KetoFest.com, you can still buy tickets. Uh, it's going to be July 21st, 22nd. It's historic, really. No, and and all your, I, I got to presume all of your VIP tickets are gone because- Oh, they're the first to go. Yeah, every time. Yeah. I think, you, which to me says they're too cheap. You should have <laughs> <Yeah>. made more. <laughs> the VIP ticket is way too cool. Yeah. Anyway, so you'll be doing Keto Fest and I'll be doing a little German tour. Right. And I'm looking forward to hearing those interviews and we'll uh, turn them into shows and put a top and tails on them and yeah. I'm sure they'd be great. They'll be awesome. Yeah. So let's roll the music for a little thing we call Better Know a Framework. Awesome. All right, man, what do you got? You know, every once in a while you come across a tool and you, you're almost embarrassed because you didn't know it existed. You know, it's like, <laughs> how that did happens. I not know about this, right? So this is one of those tools. It's Terraform. Uh, Terraform.io. Uh, oh, the HashiCorp folks. HashiCorp, yeah. yeah. So Terraform is a tool for building, changing, and versioning infrastructure, and it can manage existing and popular service providers as well as custom in-house solutions. So it uses configuration files that describe the components needed to run either a single app or the entire data center, and it generates an execution plan describing what it'll do to reach the desired state and then execute it to build that described infrastructure. So, and as that configuration changes, Terraform can determine what changed and and create these incremental execution plans, which can then be applied. It's very cool. But the first question I had was, what's the difference between this and stuff like Chef and Puppet, right? Right, right. So, right from their website, configuration management tools install and manage software on a machine that already exists. Terraform is not a configuration management tool. And it allows existing tooling to focus on their strengths, bootstrapping and initializing resources. Using provisioners, Terraform enables any configuration management tool to be used to set up a resource once it's been created. Terraform focuses on the higher level abstraction of the data center and associated services without sacrificing the ability to use configuration management tools to do what they do best. It also embraces the same codification that is responsible for the success of those tools, making entire infrastructure deployments easy and reliable. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, we've talked about HashiCorp before on a couple of shows where we're talking about Vagrant, which is sort of the the first tool you insert along this chain. Yes, I remember now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Because Terraform comes a little later down the path where it's like now you're assembling the system. Right, right. But uh, you build out your VMs initially with Vagrant. I was Justin James, as I recall. (laughs) Of course you do. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. Know it, learn it, love it. And uh, who's talking to us today, Richard? Ah, I grabbed a comment off of show 1534, the one we did with Casey Ulanuth, where we talked about Visual Studio 2017 and all the sort of productivity in there. Because, you know, Casey, she's she is a fan oh, of yeah. making developers more productive. And I think she solicited that show several times. It's like, hey, let me know how you're using this. Let me know how <laughs> I can help you with that. Yeah. And she's very keen. And so we got a bunch of comments on that show, all kinds of good conversation. This one's from Dominic, who said, thanks for the great show. I always love hearing about new and awesome productivity and support tools. Visual Studio, with all its refactorings and cool extensions like OzCode and CodeMade, is a great example of such fantastic and powerful must-have tools. Mm. 
Recently, I've switched to Mac OS and Visual Studio for Mac, and I can't underestimate how much I've been relying on those, quote, light bulb suggestions and great extensions. Man, Dominic, yeah. that's a tough move. You know, yeah. I know they call it Visual Studio, but, you know, it's it's the old Xamarin tooling. They've been making it more like Visual Studio. We did that great show with Mich- Michaela mm-hmm. uh, talking about some of the new features, but it's it's a tricky shift. Uh and Dominic goes on to say, uh, I went online looking for some user user voice for Visual Studio for Mac, and it was great to see so many suggestions and an active discussion over there. I can't wait to see what Visual Studio for the Mac is getting more and more mature, just like Visual Studio is already. So, yeah, you know, I, I just this comment excited me from the point of view of here's someone who is used to the Windows Visual Studio has come to the Mac for a variety of reasons and then is still happy. Like it yeah, recognizes right. that, yeah, there's more, obviously always more to do, but that's inevitable. But very, very cool. So, Dominic, thank you so much for your comment. A copy of Music to Code By is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music to Code By, write a comment on the website at .netrocks.com or via any of our social media because we publish every show to Facebook and Google+. Plus. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music to Code By. And definitely follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin. He's at Rich Campbell. Definitely send us a tweet. We code by them. Mm. <laughs> no, maybe not. I don't know. We- you know, every once in a while, you got to have a bugger. <laughs> uh, let's bring Dylan on. Dylan Reisenberger is the architect and lead developer on Poly, the open source resilience library for .NET. He taught himself to code in assembly language. Raw. Mm. Huzzah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and C, of course, back in the 80s. And as a teenager, he spent time building a compiler for a Pascal-like language and wrote a text editor in it, which begs the question, why would you do that? (laughs) His words, not mine. I know why you would do that. Professionally, he's been working in the .NET space and C Sharp since version 1.0 in the mid-2000s. Welcome, Dylan. Hey, it's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, well, good to have you on. And uh, how timely it is to be talking about Polly right now as it goes into the .NET Core. Yeah, with the ASP.NET Core 2.1 is kind of just out, isn't it? Um, I think it was kind of last week, started last week. Mm. And um, we've been working with the Microsoft folks through the spring on you know building an integration between Poly and, um, and .NET Core 2.1 to make it easier for people to, to use resilient strategies when they're making HTTP calls. So let's go back a little bit to the, the genesis of Poly. This is Michael Wolfenden, right? Yeah, and I think there's e- even another guy involved beforehand, if I get this right, a guy who was called um, Renat Abdullin, um, who was part of the LOCAD team. And there was the kind of LOCAD shared libraries that started some of the concepts. Mm. And then Michael Wolfenden took that and made it bigger and carried it forward into Poly. Um, and then around late 2015, I think he it, he came up on the website and was like, he wanted to hand on the baton. And um, yeah. I was around the project a lot, already involved contributing things. And um, Joel Hulan of the AppV Next team, you know, didn't want to see the project founder and came forward, said, we'll take it on, right. brought me on board. Um, and I just had a huge number of ideas for how we could grow Poly, you know, how we could take this concept and add more um, resilient strategies to it. There, there wasn't a, a kind of key player in the .NET space for that. Um, everybody's heard of Hystrix for Java, and that's very big in the Java space, but right. there wasn't a .NET equivalent. Um, so I've been driving Poly forward um, uh, ever since, and yeah, it seems to keep on growing, and we keep adding more to it. Yeah, I think it started on .NET Rocks anyway as a better know framework. And right. uh, I started using it in projects, and uh, I, I loved it. And then everybody in AppV Next started using it, and we were all over it. So it seemed like a natural fit that we uh, shepherded it. But yeah. and, and since then, um, the downloads on GitHub have been going crazy, I know. But let's, let's back up a little bit and just talk uh, about the problems that Poly solves and, you know, by extension, the ones that it doesn't solve. Yeah, right. Okay. So, I mean, Poly is basically a, a resilience and transient fault handling library. So kind of, I guess everybody's familiar with transient faults, you know, network blips, you can get things that become unavailable for a short amount of time. And a lot of people come to Poly for the retry policies around that and for the kind of circuit breaker policies around that. Um, so kind of when I came bo- on board, I was looking at the concept and thinking, well, we can take this further and we can... Um, 
you know, build further resilient strategies too, and some that are actually kind of more proactive. So they're not just reacting to faults when faults occur, mm. but allow you to put in stability patterns that are going to help your application or your microservice or your um, Xamarin app or whatever uh, you know, be more resilient, particularly in the kind of cloud at scale environments with the microservices. So um, we added bulkhead isolation, which gives you a lot of kind of things around load management. Um, timeout policy is kind of fairly trivial, yeah. I guess. Um, cache policy so that you can remember the value of previous calls and yeah yeah, and yeah, yeah that's kind of kind of pretty obvious one um so the the i guess the two that a lot of people use together is a timeout and a retry and you know that because we're so flexible a lot of people have this analysis paralysis when using tools like this they're like how many times should i retry i mean because you know you're basically asking people are asking themselves to predict the future when we have a a, a few really good patterns that we've uh, figured out just that other people do right like you might want to uh, depending on what the thing is if uh if you think the only kind of blip you're going to get is an is a network blip like your network is down then you um, might want to just retry a few times and then expand the time out as you go down and maybe after a certain number of retries or a certain amount of time has passed then then you know you can notify somebody, but there are also times when you just want to keep retrying forever, right? Like, yeah, that- if you have a client app, right, that has to send some data that was just collected to the cloud, and a calculation has to be done before the next step in the application can go on. It's, it's either it, you you wait and wait until it's done, or you close the app. I mean, there's no there's no other choice. I kind of think the trick is not you know not retrying every millisecond. Right. I think that that's exactly it. I mean, we provide a lot of options, but uh, so you've got a lot of flexibility. You can choose how you want to make that work. But people maybe come along and say, well, I'll just put some retries in. Um, But exponential back off, which I think, you know, you're kind of uh, alluding to, Carl, is, is, yeah, is if you kind of just retry every second, well, maybe if that system down uh, underlying system's really gone down, you're just going to be adding more load to it. So exponential right. back off says, if we're not getting a response, let's try a little bit less often, maybe two seconds, four seconds, eight, 15, whatever. Yeah, you may create a denial of service attack unwittingly if you uh, just continue to hammer it. That's it. You've got to strike the balance between getting your retries in to get that result. To it. And you've got to think about the fact that, you know, if an underlying system has gone down, you might have... 50 parallel calls from other people all trying to do the same thing at the same time. So so exponential back off in time between your retries is kind of really big, big pattern. Um, another one for people to think about um, is maybe is, is jitter. If you're in a really high frequency system, that is. So again, it's about the same same concept. You know, you want to put retries in, but you don't actually want to create your own thundering herd problem where the retries you're putting in are themselves causing a load problem. Yeah. So the the if you've got a kind of fixed back off and you're going to say we well, try after two seconds, after four, after eight, whatever, uh, and you're dealing with hundreds of calls a second, at the point that underlying system goes down. If all the retries are on the same scale, then two <laughs> seconds later, you, you're going to get another step spike and you've got to do your maths right Just wait here. eight seconds from now, I'm going to kick you in the face again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's like, let's, let's, let's have a spike. Let's have a surge we made ourselves. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so, and this actually is, you know, also done actually in the underlying network topology level. I read, I'm not a kind of Cisco networks um, expert at all, but, but, to come back to the point about jitter, what that is, is you add some randomness into the intervals between the retry right. um, so that you're spreading out that load so that some of those callers are coming back at different times. So you're um, less of a rapier, more of a sledgehammer? <laughs> yeah, I hadn't really kind of thought you were, I was going to say more of a scatter gun. I'm not sure that sounds like a helpful <laughs> yeah, metaphor either. But yeah, either no, way. Yeah, did, did you want the sniper rifle or the shotgun? What makes you happier? <laughs> Prepare right. to die. There's a major metaphor failure going on. Sorry, today. Yeah, <laughs> I know. This is, yeah, that one needed a bit of thought, didn't it? I can't. Um, well, let's talk, let's talk about the circuit breaker because this is one I think that people kind of have a... I don't know. It, the, the metaphor is a little bit weird because when the when a circuit is closed is when it's working, 
And right. when a connection is open is when it's working. So, so we have a kind of a disconnect. And it's kind of opposite to a gateway. So people are used to thinking of the idea that something's open, things flow through it, and something's closed, and they don't. Right. right. And yes, yeah, so circuit breakers the other way around, right? So the, the electricity metaphors are backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Well, th- there's a there's a logic to it, which which kind of helps once you know what it is. And the analogy is with the electrical circuit breaker in your house. So it's with electrical current flowing. You know, if the circuit is closed in an electrical circuit, if the circuit breaker is closed, then then things will flow, things will happen. If you break the circuit, then they won't. So yeah, to kind of compare retry and circuit breaker, you know, retry plays for success. It says like we think this is just a transient fault. Let's give it another go. And circuit breaker is like hang on, maybe it's not just transient. Maybe this has really gone down. Let's back off. So um, what a circuit breaker does is it measures the level of faults um, on calls that, be, that are being placed through that policy. And if the level of faults is too much, and you can do that by consecutive number, or you can do it by proportion of calls, whatever. If the level of faults is too much, then it breaks the circuit for a period and stops putting calls through. Now, that means that the calling code gets an exception. It doesn't even try. It exactly. says, I'm sorry, but you can't do this right now. Right. Right, which is the system saying, we believe this, the thing you're calling is down. It's just right. not there at the moment. And so maybe now they can go to a failover strategy, do something else. I mean, I, I've seen plenty of systems get hung up on a partially working service. You know, it's totally. still connecting to it and it's responding, but it's super slow. You know, and if they just would fail over to the other machine, they'd be fine. You think of what you do as a user, though, right? When you're using a piece of software that's really slow, what do you do? You close it and go do something else until yeah. it come back to it when yeah, it's ready. Yeah, don't, you don't want to lose those people from your website. This yeah. is exactly the, the, this is the, the limit of people's patience, isn't there, before they go to the competitor. So um, it's exactly about that. You don't want people on the 22nd, you don't want all the callers on the 22nd timeout to get the same message. So the circuit breaker breaks, it's saying, we believe this thing is down. So you've got several advantages. You're, you're failing fast. You're getting a fast response out to the users to say, we believe that thing's not there. And then, yeah, like you say, Richard, you can do the graceful degrade. You can give them a message telling them about that, or we can fail over to um, another system. So, so one advantage, you fail fast to the user, you get back to them quickly, but you're also taking the load off the downstream system for a period. So if it right. is struggling with load, if it's trying to recover, you're cutting the load for um, a period. Yeah. And what, what the circuit breaker typically does is put a test call through when that, that um, break period is over to see if the underlying system is responding again and doesn't immediately reflood it with a full load. So... Um, yeah, so that's the circuit breaker. Uh-huh. It's it's a kind of like an isolation unit. It's the whole point of it is to stop the failure propagating back upstream as well. Right. We, if we talk if we talk about patterns in resilience um, in distributed systems, one of the key things you want to avoid is a cascading failure. And in fact, yeah. a lot of the resilience primitives are kind of aimed at at stopping that happen. And we can talk about some later. Hey, Dylan, hold that thought for just a second while we pause for this very important message. Hey, Carl here to say that Music to Code By is now an app called Music to Flow By. Now you can listen to the tracks on your phone with offline capability. The first three tracks are free, and the entire catalog is available by subscription with a new track arriving every month. Just go to musictoflowby.com for all the links. All right, and it's .NET Rocks. We're back. I'm Carl Franklin. That's Richard Campbell. And that is Dylan Reisenberger. We're talking about poly. We're talking about transient failure handling and, and how to do that with policies, hence the word poly. Um, I, and we were just talking about the circuit breaker. Some of, One of the best examples of uh, resilience like this that I've seen, in a web app anyway, is Gmail. You know, your Wi-Fi connection goes down, you get a little yellow tag across the top that says, oops, something happened, retrying again in, and then it counts down. And then it's also a retry now button, link, whatever, that you can do if you think, you know, you don't want to wait for the period to be up, you can just retry. That's a really nice interaction because it allows the user to take over if they know better. In other words... If you if you know that your network just came back up and it's still waiting, you know, th- for three minutes before it's going to try to refresh your inbox, you can say, "Okay, try it now." Yeah, it's awesome. 
is awesome. And they're giving you feedback as well on screen so you know what's happening, which is yeah, another good angle for that, isn't it? Right. It's be- uh, much better than, you know, message box show. You know, sorry, <laughs> I can't be a yeah. piece of software right now. Go away. <laughs> yeah. It also occurs to me, it's like, there's nothing here you couldn't code yourself, but why would you? Right. Yeah, that's right. And in a way, that's the point of open source, isn't it? You know, somebody's built a library for that. Don't reinvent the wheel. And we've got 1,600 tests, I think it is, on Poly now. So it's unit tested. We know it works. Yeah. You know, the whole point of a library is that that, that piece is taken care of you. There's somebody busy maintaining it or somebody's. And uh, that class of work, it just makes my life easier. Uh, and yeah. you do it the right way each time, right? You don't code it over and over again. You have it just yeah. be able to apply it as a policy. Yeah, Actually, yeah. How what does it look like to apply it as a policy? So this is, yeah, one, one thing we consciously did is we wanted to make these policies that you could apply anywhere in your mm. code. So they're not tied to making HTTP calls with HTTP clients. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're not, you know, they're not tied to any particular underlying system. So actually, you define a policy first up front. You say policy dot handle the kind of exceptions you want to handle or other faults dot retry however many times or whatever back off strategy. Um, and that's defined to a policy instance you can use anywhere around your app. And you can stick them in a policy registry and pass that around by DI and pull the correct policies out where you want to use them. Um, and you can use that with a might be a special API for a, a message bus or something, or it might right. be a you know, special API for your calls to your data store, might be an HTTP client for calling out to another service. Um, a lot of people sometimes ask about kind of the differences between Hystrix and Poly because they might have come from the Java world or they're looking for something like Hystrix. And and right. you've got to make no mistake here, Hystrix is, is totally awesome and they really blaze the trail in this kind of whole area. Um, but when people ask me about that, and when you kind of look at the code base there, one thing is that the the policies you apply are very kind of tightly coupled to the code you want to execute. And we wanted to make sure that we didn't do that in policy. So you can define these policies and you can use them anywhere. You, when you, your question, um, Richard, when you, how, how do you use them? You say policy.execute and you pass in a delegate and you pass in input parameters you might use with that delegate and that's all you can do you all you have to do you can run any delegate through that code and it's all um fully async await compatible as well you know all through the internals yeah and i love the idea of being able to apply these policies to something like async await called code where i really don't know when it's going to finish so i don't know that it was failed or was just taking its time as it normally does so i think that's really interesting yeah, and to take that point further about being able to take a policy as, as a unit to kind of uh, uh, and and apply it anywhere, um, that also lets you stack them up and use them in combination. So right. one of the first things I yeah, one of the first things I was interested in when I came into Poly, uh, and a lot of other people come up with the same question when they come to start using it is like, okay, I've got a retry, I've got that, yeah. but but I also want a circuit breaker. How do I use those together? But because you can execute anything, it was kind of really obvious to me early on that you could execute one policy through another. Um, so we built that into a concept, and it's a bit like a, a monad is in, in Link or Rx. So you can actually build up a kind of stack of policies, like they're a stack of functions you're going to apply to your underlying delegate. We, we call that a policy wrap, if anybody's yeah. familiar with it or wants to go and look for it on the website. But that means you can say... I want to retry three times with back off, but I want to put those retries through the circuit breaker so that if between the waiting for the retry they actually is detected to break the circuit, I don't try again. And I want to impose an overall timeout on all of those um, retries. And I want to have a fallback policy. If it all goes wrong, I degrade gracefully. And I can express that all in, in one strategy that stacks the policies up and then just, just use that as my resilience policy dot execute. Yeah, that's the, the fluent nature of it and the way that you can just wrap these things together. It's, it's amazing. And yeah. in the demo that you put together, you can see the difference between, you know, nested uh, it's it's almost like having nested try catch blocks, right? But, it, yeah. yeah, and and just having one policy that you just execute. Yeah, that, that that's exactly it. And and um, 
yeah, we put together a series of demos that show how the resilience improves as you begin to layer more than one policy together and use them in combination. So if people are kind of new to poly and interested in exploring that, yeah, head over to poly samples because we kind of start with demo one, which is mm. just some retries, but hey, there isn't any weight between them or there isn't any back off. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the, the, the demos work their way up through the concepts that we've been talking about until there's a combination of, of retry, circuit breaker and timeout. I forget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, but it's, it's, it's all there. Um, you know, and those, those are, acting against the kind of dummy faulting server that we provide so you can see the kind of way that, that the policies handle things the most interesting thing to me to richard's point here is that this is all code you could write and in fact if you go look at the source for poly when you get down to the essence of it it's a wrapper around try catch <laughs> <laughs> but with the math around you know how often and how many and how long to wait and you oh, know. of course of course i mean it's the difference between doing a try catch for every little contingency and writing all this crazy code yeah and then saying create me a policy that when this list of exceptions happens this code happens when this exception happens that code or all exceptions it's just so much cleaner in your app yeah right and clearer i mean we we've read code that was buried in try catch and other recovery mechanisms where you're like, I don't know what this code does, yeah. except that it's very pessimistic about trying to get it mm -hmm. done. Yeah. But with the policies, you also get a kind of separation of concerns. I mean, I got kind of two points to that with the sure. policies, you get a kind of separation of concerns. So you've defined your policy in one place. You can even draw that out of config. Um, you can change it dynamically if you're using the registry and that's separate from where you're applying the policy that actually really helps your testability as well because if you've got a unit you want to test but you want to test it without the policies in place you can pass in a, a mocked out stubbed out policy that, that right. does nothing we've got one of those available so you can stub out poly when not having it interfering in your tests so that's, um, alternatively you can test your policies um, to come back to another thing um, yeah, I mean, a lot of poly, poly is a kind of very fluent, glorified try-catch, if you like, but that comes mm -hmm. back to the point about the reactive policies versus the proactive. So I guess the retry and the circuit breaker and the fallback that are the reactive policies are the ones that are more like a try-catch. Yeah. And then we went on and said, we can we can do more than that. So, so what's in... What I loved about Poly when I dived in the source code is that it's an incredibly simple concept at the core. Right. And a policy is kind of defined as you've got a delegate you want to run, which is an action. And what a policy boils down to is an action on an action mm -hmm. um, in a kind of generics kind of way, action with, with your, your less than and greater than signs on an action. So it's like saying, given a delegate, what do you want to do with it? But actually, you can do anything. It doesn't have to be about try catch sure so when so when we get into bulkhead isolation we're getting into how else can we handle these delegates that can promote resilience and stability in the system right and i want to talk about that in just a minute but richard you know what time it is now uh, it must be that happy time again yes it is it's time to warn tropical bird lovers that you should never give a whole lobster to a parrot well not without um a cracker. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Save uh, me. <laughs> gratuitous parrot jokes. It's actually time. Oh, to, yeah. Yeah. It's actually time to give away a Telerik DevCraft toolkit to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. But first, let me tell you about Conversational UI from Progress Telerik and Kendo UI. Conversational UI are chat bot framework agnostic user interface controls and components that enable .NET and JavaScript developers to create modern conversational chatbot experiences in their web, mobile, and desktop applications. The industry's first package set of user interface components built specifically for chatbots are available as part of the company's Telerik, ASP.NET, AJAX, ASP.NET MVC, ASP.NET Core, WinForms, WPF, Xamarin products, and Kendo UI for jQuery, Angular, Vue, React, PHP, and JSP libraries. <laughs> In other words, everything. Everything. <laughs> Uh, Use by, it anyway. Yeah. By implementing key UI design features such as calendars, date pickers, list views, and others that are included in the tool sets, 
Developers will be able to improve chatbot conversation through visual elements that enhance the natural flow of conversation. It's a really cool product, and check it out at Telerik.com slash conversational dash UI. Well, all right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner, Richard, is Srinivas Patel. Congratulations, Srinivas. Congratulations, clap for you. Srinivas. Little clap us. And Srinivas wins the uh, Telerik DevCraft Toolkit just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. A big pile of awesome from our friends over at Telerik just for being a member. And if you want to know what the fan club is and how to join, go to .NET Rocks.com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and join the fan club. We have thousands of members all over the world. In every show, we like to give away stuff from our sponsors. And every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of said fan club. But you got to sign up to win. All right, Dylan, it's your turn. If you had $5,000 to spend on technology today, what do you think you'd be buying? Oh, wow. What a question. So so my kind of question back is, am I allowed to spend it on old technology? Of course. Absolutely. Of course. Okay, so here we go. So, I mean, it's quite interesting, isn't it, looking at developers, because a lot of us are into to different certain other things, and it might be, we've got a lot of musicians, haven't we? And there's also oh, a yeah. lot of people into photography, yes. and I'm into photography. And, oh. um yeah, if people Google me, you know, they'll find a kind of photography website as well. And at one point, I got paid to go to Italy and take wow. photographs. Oh, man. Amazing. we got to ask the important question, Canon or Nikon? Yeah, well, I'm about to come back and say Fuji. No, the answer, <laughs> the answer is, the answer is, is Nikon and, and a bit of a Hasselblad. But this right. comes, kind of comes back to the point. So what I'm really into is, is panoramic photography. Oh, cool. Um, and in the early 2000s, Fuji made a camera called the Fuji GX617. So it's actually 15 years old from 2003. Um, and it's a film camera and it shoots you transparencies uh, on that um, medium format film. I don't know what you call it in the US, six centimeter or two and a half inch or 110 film or 220 film, people might know it as. But you end up with a transparency that's six centimeters high and, and 17 wide. So that's about wow. one to three. And one of those on a light box is absolutely awesome. Mm. So I, I was looking on eBay, the, the, you know, the camera itself, even secondhand now, 15 years later, sets you back about $1,000. Mm. It's got three interchangeable lenses that are dedicated lenses just for that camera. Um, you get even only four shots on a roll. Um, you can tell I was kind of been following this camera. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, it's an amazing piece of kit and, and, um, gives you amazing quality. It's an interesting thing as well because people are kind of quite into old school kit. I was going to ask Carl, does that happen with guitars as well? I mean, do people oh, kind of gosh. hang Jeez, after the- dude. <laughs> Holy man. The vintage guitar market is the, where the money is. Craziest thing. Yeah, and, and guitars tend to, well, I don't know about today's guitars, but historically, they have tended to appreciate and value as long as they've been kept in good condition. Yeah. I mean, right. any any sort of World War II era Martin acoustic guitar is going to be worth a bazillion dollars if it's in any kind of condition. 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s Stratocasters and Les Pauls and guitars right. are always worth a lot of money. And, you know, when you come across one, and it looks like you just somebody just bought it in the store, and it's like a 1963 Telecaster or something like that. You know, people drool over that stuff. And there's a thing with that in photography too, as well. It's true, and that that really mint editions of the the kind of early cameras is a thing. I kind of like to use my cameras. I've never kept them that neat. But there was a whole period in photography where you know everybody was getting out of film and going into digital, and you right. could also pick up this you know, amazing um, film medium. Yeah. yeah, and um, so I, there's I a guy down at the end of the hall here at the studio who has one of those big box cameras with the enormous film plates that slide in, and you you have to put a black, uh, you know, canopy over yourself uh, to take the picture and that kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, I found an eBay listing for a GX six seventeen. Buy it now, forty two hundred bucks, and it's the Ooh. body, the ninety mil lens, and the hundred eighty mil lens, and a couple of finders. Yeah. So I'm within budget. <laughs> yeah, in budget with light yeah. flare, it says. Mm. Man. Yeah. This, this is an obsession I do not need. Yeah, I, I know. Me too. <laughs> no, I got enough going on, but I could totally relate to 
this they are beautiful it's very odd it's very uh, you know very wide you know that weird format but the way i feel about golf richard (laughs) people are like you play golf i'm like i don't have that kind of time or or (laughs) patience man i I think james joyce nailed it when he said golf is a good walk ruined (laughs) rosie o'donnell men in ugly pants walking (laughs) that's the whole point of that kind of photography is it kind of slows you down but um yeah anyway that's a kind of whole other topic how do you feel about the sort of 360 cameras, the the Theta S's and that, you know, the, the two lenses, so you're literally taking a hemisphere at a shot? Right. Yeah, I've got some friends who are kind of very into that. Um, it's kind of weird in the sense that it's obviously all around and you can't see the photographer at all. So it's, it's like being at every place on on the, the Google visualizer, isn't it, where you can rotate right. in every direction? Um I think it can be absolutely brilliant for interiors of buildings. I think yeah. where it really, you know, either you're, you, you're doing it for the interior of a department store, or the interior of a hotel, or, you know, a great Gothic cathedral, something like that, um, you can make an amazing uh, shot and it doesn't have to be in parts and you've got the continuity. Um, it hasn't worked for me. I think then it's almost too wide for landscapes. You know, yeah. the, part of landscape photography is also about selecting the best bit, and and mm. you're not going to be surrounded on every side by gorgeous. Yeah, things. you're, you're basically look- punting on composition when you do this. Yeah, right. Uh, but I, I, the other thing I found was uh, you're right. You know, you're talking about a 180 degree lens. Uh, I got one of the Theta S's when we did the Arctic Ocean expedition, and what I liked about it was I was able to put it on the end of a selfie stick. And fire it, you know, pointed at a at a polar bear, so that you got a shot of the polar bear looking at us on the ship and us looking at the polar bear at the same time. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, the problem with those cameras is people hold them, and then your hand turns into a little stump. Yeah, the the, th- the thumb of yeah. doom, I called it. That's the- <laughs> is, yeah, I, I I was shown a lens in a in a amazing Nikon shop in London, Greater Westminster, and and. Uh, I think it was an eight millimeter fisheye lens, and it, yeah, the lens could actually see behind itself. I mean, <laughs> wow. they, they, they showed that you had your hand slightly behind the lens, and it was in the edge of the picture, it was still so in the is, edge of the shot. Wow. So it was beyond 180 degrees. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, let's get back to Polly. Yeah. So yeah, I do, I do yeah. want to talk about these sort of proactive things, the, the ideas of bulkhead and cash. It's very interesting to think that way. Yeah. Bulkhead in particular is one that's uh, uh, it's a, it makes a really great demo. But before we talk about Bulkhead, let's talk about the server that we set up. You mentioned it that uh, simply uh, has a, a little constraint to fail after what the fourth call in a five second period. I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we just set up a, a, a faulting server that would that would do that. That's part of the poly samples, so that um, you got something to test against, and and you can run it locally and 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 test a different kind of policies against that. Um, it actually kind of brings me on to um, a kind of idea I had to go in a different direction with poly. This is very off the wall, an idea that came to me a few weeks ago. But I was thinking, like, if you got policies in your calls as middleware um around the system you've already constructed you know we could actually turn this on the head on its head and we could use policies to inject failure to do a bit of kind of chaos engineering testing i was thinking of calling it something like poorly poly or sick power (laughs) and um but you know some people have got systems set up where they have got the policies in place in every call and and we could quite simply create a policy to one in a hundred times out of five second delay or to uh, to introduce a failure. There are obviously other systems out there for that as well at the kind of networking level and mm. things. But, um, you know, it's kind of an interesting project for somebody to go away and do um, because you can do anything with a, with a, with a policy. Sure, sure. Uh, tell us what uh, the bulkhead isolation is. Yeah. So this is a kind of um, more proactive approach. Uh, we find it something less used, I'm, I'm, which is why it's really good to, to, to talk about. So the idea of a bulkhead comes from shipping. It comes from the idea that a bulkhead was a portion of a ship that you could seal off from other portions of the ship. So if the hull of the boat you know, was damaged and hold and you got water flooding in, they shut the bulkhead doors and only that part fills with water and the whole ship doesn't sink. So the concept is the same for software. It's saying 
let's limit the resources that this operation can consume. So if something goes wrong, if something goes rogue, it doesn't sink the whole ship. It doesn't bring down the whole host, which is like it doesn't chew the whole CPU. It doesn't mm. choose all the memory. Or yeah. chew I, all I always the, think whatever. in terms of memory, right? It's like this piece yeah. is clearly leaking memory. Stop calling it. Exactly. And you can get into situations where, you know, you've got a microservice, say, that's managing your users or whatever it is, and you, you can end up with one stream of calls starving um, other streams of resources. Right. So um, so there's a really good metaphor for bulkhead isolation that, that I came across the other day. Think of, think of when you go to the supermarket. I don't know if this is the same in the, on a Saturday morning in the U.S. as it is in the U.K., but, you know, you go on a Saturday morning, there's all the families with their kids, that would be me as well, um, you know, with $200 of the whole week shopping in huge trolleys going through the aisles. And if you just wanted to go in there and get your bottle of orange juice and your newspaper, just two things, if you were stuck behind all of those full trolleys, you'd have the weekly shoppers completely <laughs> kind of starving you of resource mm -hmm. to check out. So that's why supermarkets have obviously got your kind of eight items or less aisle or your basket's right. own aisle. You have that, presumably you have the same kind of thing in the US. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, and another kind of very similar metaphor is that airline check-in, you know, the economy class with the big Q versus the, the first and the premium where they've got a dedicated desk. So that's really all that by bulkhead isolation is. It's saying we're going to set a certain amount of parallelism for these calls and we're going to set a certain amount of parallelism for other calls um, and that it allows you to reserve capacity to make sure that one stream of calls can't kind of swamp the application and, and bring everything down. When you're talking about resources, are you talking about threads and memory as well? Uh, it explicitly manages parallelism. So it's actually okay. underneath. It's a really simple parallelism throttle. It's just saying in this process, I want to, you can say, I want to allow a maximum of 20 of these to run at a time, and I'm happy to have a queue of 10 of them behind. Mm. And you can obviously parameterize all of that. Um, um, I mean, obviously, it interacts with a lot of other things you might do in your resilient strategy. So if these are microservices in a cloud environment, you're obviously thinking about scaling out. Um, so we've made it so that you can also interrogate that bulkhead, get properties of it, of how full it is and how many things are queuing, and you can use that as a trigger for scaling out. Yeah, yeah. Like you think exactly, you've got a point where the software is able to say up to the infrastructure, hey, I should have more of me. Right, e exactly. Um, and, but the, the whole kind of concept is you actually want to either start scaling out or you want to shed load before things are becoming right before you actually tip over. So you, you oh. said you, you'd rather than measure the machine is struggling, you're just measuring a count of threads that says, "Hey, beyond this threshold, we should have some more redundancy." Yeah, right. And because everything's as async await these days, you know, we're not actually kind of managing a thread pool and 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 doing threads for you, but it's just just limiting the parallelism. Right. Yeah, and it's an in, it's an interesting question because you know we get some people have come to us and said, but. Why would you do that? Why would you throw away capacity when the server might have more that it could actually uh, use? But I mean, this is the whole point. You don't want to find out where the, what the limit is. is. Yeah, exactly. There's yeah. a guy called Ty Tyler Treat who's written a great article on this, which we can put in the links for the show. But you know, if you don't set an explicit limit, there is always an implicit limit there. Some time and you don't want to hit that by accident yeah you know and as a guy who's danced along the edge of that many times for fun and profit the path of failure on a server is not clean you know it's not like the machine just hits a wall and tips over it gets to these ugly places where now you've got a bunch of workloads starting to back up queues are filling up things like that before it actually does tip over like exactly. you just don't actually want to be there if what you care about is uptime yeah exactly so, so that's really about stability by by saying let's keep things stable, let's scale out if we need to, mm. um, and and um, and this is how much load we want to take. And the demo is brilliant because you have a, um, a a server that doesn't fail, and then you have a server call that does fail, and there there's two of them. There's one with you know when both of these are trying to run at the same time, the one that fails prevents the one that is healthy from actually communicating. And so exactly. It, yeah. And then when you yeah. implement the bulkhead, which is just a couple lines of code, and none of that happens. Yeah. 
Exactly. We do the resource starvation demo. Here's here's how the cores that could be healthy get starved if you don't have any kind of partitioning of, of the resources you want to use. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's a deadlock stashed away in there somewhere too, where because the bulky call was tying up all the resources, the lightweight call that could have finished the bulky call never got caught. It never finished. Yeah. It's the eight items or less basket that can't yeah. check out. Right. Exactly. Yeah, you, you mentioned caching, and uh, um, the way Polly approaches caching is sort of just to let you use whatever cache you have, right? But plug that into your strategy, just in case. Yeah. Uh, just in case you want to be able to use it at that yeah. level. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, when we put that out, some people ask, "Why is Polly getting into caching? What's that about?" Was <laughs> it? Well, it is. First of all, we don't we haven't written our own cache providers. You plug in Redis or you plug in memory cache for a very local thing, whatever. We link to the ASP.NET Core cache interfaces. Um, but basically, if you don't have to make the call, of course, you're reducing network traffic and you're reducing latency. So that that is promoting stability. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, um, what what about how would Poly work in a service bus situation? Yeah, that's that's. Very possible, and I've I've actually kind of implemented that in a microservices environment in the past. So you can run that at various levels. You could have messaging guarantees at various levels. So you, your first guarantee could be, I want to guarantee that I publish this message. Yeah. So you've got some kind of retry policies as you're getting the message out to the bus. And then the, the bus itself has got its own guarantees about preserving the message i mean I, there's differences between a zero service bus and you know a, a bank grid how long they retain things for rabbit mq you know, has different retention policies but you can choose a, a messaging technology that's you can configure for the kind of preservation of messages you want uh, and they will guarantee to deliver the messages and how kind of handshakes yes i did get this message um and at the receipt end, you can have guaranteed message processing. So you can say, I want to retry processing this message, or I want to reject this message um, mm. if I haven't been able to succeed three times. Um, and there's a few other things to think about in that scenario. Uh, you can get problems with poison messages. You've got to look at, you know, what it, if this message has failed 10 times in a row, maybe I don't want to keep sending it round and round and clogging yeah. up the system. Right. Um, and then you can get into what we call the message hospital, which is like <laughs> some, yeah, <laughs> the infirmary. <laughs> so, some people call it the dead letter queue and there's a kind of slight difference because the dead letter queue is the things you can't deliver. You haven't got anywhere you can send them. Yeah. But the message hospital is ones that you just <laughs> couldn't process and, and they were doing something bad, but you, you put them in a, a, a queue to be looked at later. Yeah. It, it, it typically, it's that particular service is down at the moment. Right. Or at least within the retry period. Yeah. Mm. And the whole thing about using asynchronous buffering between microservices by using a service bus, you know, is another kind of resilience strategy sure. between microservices that, that that's out there. So so one distinction I like to make is that poly policies are really kind of about your in process resilience, but obviously as you think about resilience for your setup as a whole, you've got mm. whatever your cloud infrastructure is offering in terms of those tools you've got the asynchronous decoupling and, and the buffering it gives you to manage load and obviously you've got your whole kind of auto scaling sets and, and and traffic manager to to load balance so before we uh before we wrap this up i, I want you to tell the story of how we got into the http client factory and uh, what were the challenges in that yeah um so Microsoft came to us in in the autumn of 2017 and said they were wanting to work on on HTTP Client Factory to to kind of fix a number of things around the usage of HTTP Client and to make it um, just just easier. Um, and this is kind of really interesting story because there's lots of very glamorous things in ASP.NET Core 2.1, which are yeah absolutely amazing. And mm. here's something that's kind of a, Everybody should be adopting HTTP <laughs> Client Factory. It's about the bread and butter of what you're doing every Fine. day in, in placing HTTP calls. So, um, should we talk a little bit about um, kind of why that was put together? Why yeah. HTTP Client Factory was put together? Yeah, right. So, there's a thing, uh, there had been some things around HTTP clients and kind of gotchas that you had to watch out for. And one was that it was. It's disposable. It fulfills our disposable. So everybody, of course, started disposing it. But um, 
the underlying thing manages a socket that gets kept around in case there are any more responses coming in. Uh, and that could actually lead to socket exhaustion if you had a very high frequency. So you've got a lot of calls going through, you're disposing your HTTP clients, and those sockets are backing up, and you could get yeah. calls failed to be placed because you've got socket exhaustion. So people went the other way and said, let's have a singleton HTTP client. Turns out that doesn't pick up DNS refreshes. So one thing that they wanted to do was to manage the lifetime of those handlers underneath for you. So if you use the new HTTP client factory in in netcore 2.1 you just don't have to worry about all of that um and the other thing that the microsoft team wanted to do is to allow you to put middleware easily into the outbound http calls um, and that had actually always been there the, the concept of a delegating handler that you could put into an outbound call i think was even there in the net framework but they yeah. wanted to be able to put poly into that um they've uh made inbuilt uh, logging providers that also measure the duration of the the call. Um, you could put authorization into that. They've got an example up on the Microsoft website where you could um, put a, a middleware handler in for service discovery using console to, to um, you know, find a particular address you want to reroute that call to before it goes out. Yeah. Um, but the part we did was to was to make it easy to put poly policies in those outbound calls. Yeah. And there was a, a situation that cropped up that we didn't anticipate with uh, strong names, right? What was that all about? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's an interesting thing because there's kind of a lot of passion around the community yeah. about strong naming. Yeah, that it that it it just creates problems. And and, and it there's a kind of ripple effect because if one package is strong named, then everything it references has to be strong named. So if right. you start from something, it takes a strong name dependency, that just ripples out. Um, and you've got packages, uh, people who understandably haven't wanted to adopt strong naming because of some of those those impacts. Um, because of poly being referenced from .NET Core, we didn't have that choice. Right. Uh, so we, we always had a strong name version of poly, but we stepped back we stepped back and took the choice that we didn't want to have both the strong named and the non non strong named in the market, because when you get into that, you could definitely have users who have a clash they could never resolve, right? So they've yeah. got a product and it's got two dependencies. Via one dependency route, it insists on having strong name poly. Via the other dependency, take has a reference to non strong name poly, and that's that's kind of not fixable. You can't use any kind of binding redirect or equivalent kind of mechanism to say just substitute one for the other. Mm -hmm. So we've gone strong named, and and um, it's it's not an unknown uh, approach. It's exactly what Newton Soft Jason is doing, and and yeah. we're we're fo following the same model that, that they are. And and that's just for the for the framework, right? I mean, if you just go to the GitHub repo for Poly, you can use that by itself, non strong named, right? Um, I guess you could build it for yourself as a non-strong name package, um, but you wouldn't get the benefit of the NuGet updates later. Mm. But you, but you don't have to be strong named yourself to reference a strong name package. Sure. So if you've got your your own app that isn't strong named, you can still reference strong name Poly, and that's there's no block to that. Yeah, that's good. That's a good thing yeah. to uh, mention. So, what's yeah. the future? What, what's next for Poly? Yeah, lot, lots of things we could do. The, the really big one is we want to get metrics and telemetry off the ground, and, and the Microsoft guys are really keen that, that we get that in place as well. Um, so, you know, you've got your microservices, you're using Poly in there to make it more resilient for how components are communicating with, with each other, but we want to be able to surface visibility of that, kind of what happened. Mm. It took three retries overall, it took 12 seconds to get there, or the circuit is down, or whatever it might be. Uh, just to make one thing clear, you can already do that in one way. You can attach delegates to policy operations, so you can say, if the circuit breaks, run this piece of code. So you can... you. You can absolutely get logging in there at the moment, but we want to make it a, a first-class part of Poly. So that actually, there's a kind of stream of events coming out of the policies in terms of what's happening as you run your call, um, mm. and then you know be able to send those events to App Insights or, or to other time series database, or so that you can you can put them up on your dashboard or anything sure. else. Yeah. 
and and that's something where you know Hystrix have an absolutely great um, product that 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 does that, and and we want to be able to do the same thing. Is there anything uh, in the store for uh, serverless functions? I mean, how does that even work? It's stateless. Yeah, that's uh, that's the other big challenge because um, I mean that really comes into a challenge where the policies need to be stateful. Um, so to circuit breaker is really the one to go over that. You know, mm. a, a retry policy is only stateful within the sense of the retries it's making, but. A circuit breaker is actually trying to measure state across cores. It's trying to, it's tracking, you know, out of the last 20 calls, three failed or mm. seven failed or, you know, whatever your, your ratio is that you're, you're not happy with. Um, but of course, functions are stateless and you run a little piece of code and it goes away again. Um, so, so it doesn't fit. So we need to, build the ability to have a kind of shared state store or something like Redis behind um, the circuit breaker. And it's a little bit complicated because it's probably not just the state of the breaker mm. we w- want to store, but we probably need to aggregate what's going, ra- going on around all the different services that are using it. Yeah. So sort of a poly as a service mindset. Indeed, yeah. If you're going to make it work in the cloud that way, where you're basically breaking up what is essentially a library into a set of services within the cloud. Yeah, we, we just want to make it make it pluggable, really, so that right. so that there's some kind of interface for the state store for the circuit breaker. Yeah. Um. So that the uh, and I think the plan is, you know, we provide a kind of standard Redis implementation for it, but mm. you know, put an interface in there so people can use what they want. Yeah. So uh, if somebody wants to get involved, this is a really great success story for an open source project. I mean, it, a couple of guys started it, handed it off to you, and then Appy Next took it over, ended up in the .NET Foundation, and made its way into uh, Core 2.1. That's a, that's a really great success story. So how would you encourage people to um, – it, it, is it as easy as just going to the poly repo, pulling it down, and submitting a pull request? I'd say, you know, definitely we're keen for people to to get involved. And I think one of the most interesting ways to get to know an open source project is is to to pull the code down and see what it's doing. Um, I think sometimes people think open source projects are kind of a black box and that does something for me, but they don't 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 look in. I um I remember before I was working on Poly, you know, and it was before Microsoft had all the, the DI stuff out in, in core, we were using Nancy FX and I pulled the source code down and I learned so much from that project, you know, big shout out to those guys. Um, so I'd really encourage you know, whatever project you're interested in, whether it's poly or something down, you know, pull down the code, have a look at it. Um, in terms of sort of people getting involved in open source projects, you know, a good way to start is to pick a project you're working on, working with that you're already using. Cause obviously you're familiar with it, um, look for where projects got up for grabs. Alternatively, you can go to upforgrabs.net, um, you know, and there's got a whole listing of projects that are looking for help where people have earmarked um, e- easier issues to start with. And they're not just C sharp. There's JavaScript and F sharp and kind of other things there. Um, I guess the other suggestion would be, you know, raise an issue first, describe what it is you're thinking of doing. Right. Um, just a couple of times in the kind of managing poly, we've had the big surprise PR where somebody's <laughs> obviously kind of worked, they've worked all weekend on something and the PR comes in on a Monday morning and it says, I changed these things and it'd be really good to do this. And you look at the PR and it's like 45 files have changed. No. Um, oh, and it's heartbreaking because as a contributor, you know how much work somebody's put into that and you yeah. don't want to mm. have to turn things down. That's not what you want to do. But, you know, maybe there would have been a much easier way of doing that. Um, or maybe it's not the direction the project wants to go or maybe it's coming a little later downstream, whatever. So definitely always talk to a project first. Raise uh, raise an issue. Say, would it be good to do this? Um, I think we could do it like this. And yeah, offer to do it. I mean, projects are, are, are crying out for help. A lot of projects are run by a small team of people. And, and the more that, that come in to help, the more the whole community will benefit. So mm. definitely. Uh, where can we go for more information, Dylan? 
We've got um, Big Read Me on the GitHub that is kind of introduction to everything. We've got a, a wiki that's got a, a deep page on each policy type, and it's got a lot of advice about patterns. It's got a um, detailed description of how to use Poly with the HTTP client factory in .NET Core 2.1 that we've talked about. We've got a Slack channel where you can come and ask questions. Um, we've got a Pluralsight course. Brian Hogan, uh, a guy from Boston, has put together an excellent Pluralsight course on how to use Poly, so that's mm-hmm. that's there. And you can come see my talk at Dev Intersection in December in Las Vegas. Right. Ah, yeah. Well, uh, Dylan, it's been great talking to you, and thanks thanks for all your hard work on Poly, and thanks for telling us all about it. No problem, and thank you very much for inviting me. You bet. And we'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Transmit a band by the FCC Yes, I'm a, a boy Life is hard Pay my taxes